Hi, everyone. In this video, I'm going to give a, a talk about cross lag panel analysis uh, based off of an example uh, from the book Discovering Structural Equation Modeling Using Stata. So, in their path analysis uh, chapter, they discuss cross lag panel designs. And um, this is the uh, model that they end up testing, or the author ends up testing right here. So uh, as we're thinking about uh, these types of designs, keep in mind that what we have are uh, measures of our variables that are measured not only at one time, but at multiple time points or through multiple waves, if you will. And uh, so in this particular example right here, we've got uh, two variables that have been measured at two time points. We've got this math seven variable right here uh, and read seven. Both of these two variables were measured at time one. Uh, basically at age seven, and both of these variables right here were measured uh, at time two, or basically at age 21. So we have the same individuals uh, kind of basically representing a panel, if you will, that are measured on our variables uh, across two time points. Um, and so as we're looking at our model, you know, uh, you can see right here that we've got this path right here, path A and path B. And so the the uh, arrow from from math seven to math twenty one path A right there is reflecting stability or the stability of measurement across those two time points. So this uh, path A is generally referred to as the autoregressive uh, path. And you might think of you know as we're thinking in terms of uh, measurement on the same variables over time, you could think of the time one measurements right here as essentially being lags of the of the uh, time two measurements. Essentially, what it is is that we have a lag between uh, the earlier measurement and the later measurement. So the earlier measurement is referred to oftentimes as a lagged variable. So we have the lag of math um, basically at time one predicting the uh, predicting math at age uh, at time two, which is at age 21. And so the A path is reflecting stability in measurement between those two time points. Then we've got the reading variable right here, the lagged read uh, seven variable right here, predicting reading at age 21. And so that B coefficient is reflecting stability over time as well. So um, again, that would be considered an autoregressive path because we're regressing our uh, math uh, 21 or our reading 21 onto the lagged versions of themselves. Now, uh, also, as we're looking at our model, you'll see that we have this uh, path C and path D right here. So in this particular case right here, we have, you know, for uh, path C, we've got math seven predicting reading at age 21. So math at age seven, predicting reading at 21. So path C is a cross lag path. We're essentially trying to predict another variable uh, at a later time point based on uh, scores on, an, on, uh, uh, on a different variable at an earlier time point. So path C is reflecting the cross lag association. And then path D is doing the same thing, just in reverse with reading seven, predicting, reading, uh, predicting math 21. So in other words, the, the conceptualization in this model is, is that, yes, we would expect that math scores and reading scores at 21 are going to be affected by earlier reading scores, but we're also going to um, assume that uh, math scores at age seven might uh, have an effect on reading at age 21, and we might also assume then that reading at uh, age seven might have an effect on math at age 21. So that's what we're essentially capturing right there. And just to kind of, you know, break this down a little bit more, if you think about, let's just take the, the math portion of the model. Uh, let's say we've got math at age seven uh, predicting math at age 21. So, in, so if we were just to run uh, just a simple regression with math 21 regressed onto uh, math seven, we would get an error term right here. Now, the, so the, uh, the uh, coefficient uh, the uh, regression coefficient is going to reflect the stability of scores on math across time. However, the error term 
I'll just kind of draw a little circle around that. Not very well, of course, but the error term is reflecting whatever is left over and that leftover stuff is going to uh, be change. We're going to uh, have change uh, over time. So that's reflecting the lack of stability over time. So we have uh, the stability uh, component, which is going to be the regression slope uh, where we are predicting uh, math 21 for math 7. And then the air term captures whatever's left over, which is going to be change. So when we add in uh, the cross lag paths, what we're essentially trying to capture is, uh, or, uh, uh, or to predict, is variation in that change uh, from uh, time 1 to time 2, or basically from age 7 to age 21. So that's kind of the way to think about it. You also see that we've got this math seven and read seven uh, covariance between these two variables. And um, and then we also have a covariance between uh, math 21 and reading 21. And the author in the uh, chapter um, uh, seems to kind of really suggest or um, take a, a stronger stance in terms of uh, saying that we should allow the error terms for the endogenous variables in this model right here, this type of model, to correlate. Um, when you're reading the research, you'll see folks that include correlated errors and those that don't. The basic idea um, by the uh, that are the basic reasoning by the author is that there's, you know, there may be uh, factors at age 21 that are outside of the model that would uh, produce some association. So, you know, I'll leave it to you to make the decision, uh, but that's kind of the stance that this author uh, has taken. So at any rate, let's go ahead and open up Stata and run this analysis. And as I go through, I'm just going to really kind of focus in uh, mainly on the results that are given in the in this uh, PDF right here. So you'll notice uh, that the results, um, you know, the author is really presenting them in, in terms in standardized form, basically the, the fully standardized results. And then you can see, too, that as you kind of scroll through, um, you've got the equation level goodness to fit. And then the path diagram has um, the uh, standardized coefficients with significance levels and so forth. So we're just going to kind of focus mainly on uh, replicating uh, what the author um, chose to do. So I'm going to go ahead and open up Stata right here, and we'll go to uh, we'll go to uh, statistics, structural equation modeling, and we'll click on this right here, the uh, SEM builder. I'll go ahead and uh, reduce the the uh, canvas size here and select. Uh, the uh, box to draw in my uh, exogenous variables, basically the age seven variables. And then we'll draw in our endogenous variables, the age 21 variables. So I'll go ahead and select the first one. We'll select uh, math seven. Then we have math 21 over here. Then we've got uh, read seven and read 21 as well. We'll draw in our covariance right here. And uh, then we'll we'll go ahead and um, draw in our paths. So I've got the autoregressive path from age from math seven to math twenty one. Then we've got the autoregressive path from read seven to read twenty one right here. And then we've got our uh, cross lag paths right here and right here. Then finally, we'll add in the covariance between the error terms uh, right 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 here. So now we've got uh, covariance between the uh, basically the disturbances. So uh, at this point, I'll uh, mention something else. Um, the, the author chooses in terms of uh, the estimation approach, we'll click on estimate right here. And the author, instead of choosing maximum likelihood, uh, he chooses maximum likelihood with missing values. So let's just take a quick look at the data. I'm gonna go into uh, Stata here and go into the data editor. And you can see, you know, the these are um, these are three of our variables right there. There's math 21 right there. And in terms of the full number of cases, there are four, uh, 430 uh, cases in the data set. So 430 rows of data. Now, as we're looking at this, you can also see that we have missing data on math 21 and these uh, and math 7, read 7, and ma uh, read 21. So. You know, some sometimes there's like a missing data on maybe just, um, you know, like at 21 right here, but then you've got uh, scores, you know, earlier on, things like that. So, you know, sometimes you just have missing data across uh, uh, 
the board, uh, except for maybe one measurement or something like that. So what the author chose to do is to use maximum likelihood uh, with missing values. And I'll show you uh, the the practical effect on do, uh, if he uh, in doing that. So if I'm going to go back and I'm just going to run the analysis using the basic maximum likelihood uh, that you see right here, and I'll click on OK. And as we look at our output, you're going to see uh, that in terms of the number of observations, we have 336. So you re recall we had 430 cases, uh, basically 430 rows of data uh, with um, various amounts of data. So we had some missing data in there. Now, the reason why we're down to 336 in terms of the data analysis is because uh, the maximum likelihood selection by itself uh, uses list-wise deletion. So basically any case that has missing data on any of those four variables gets removed from the analysis and then the estimates are generated on the remaining uh, cases. So if we choose, if I go up here and I choose instead, which is what the author uh, chose to do, maximum likelihood with missing values, and I click on OK, then in this particular instance, you'll see that the number of observations, the number of effective observations during our analysis is 416. So that's quite a difference between uh, 336 and 416. So we maintain a lot more of the information uh, from our data set as a result of using the maximum likelihood with missing values option. And the syntax for that, or at least the um, the uh, that particular option, um, I'll just refer to it as MLMV. That's kind of how they lay it out um, in, uh, in terms of the syntax. But basically, what this is referring to is full information, maximum likelihood. So there's our estimation method right there. So if we were looking at the, um, the, the model specification, you'll see that in terms of the model specification, uh, we've got the SEM function uh, and we've got, you know, math seven with an arrow pointing to math 21 right there, math seven pointing to reading 21, read seven to math 21, read seven to pointing to read 21. There's the uh, covariance um, uh, option right there and so forth. Then if we scroll down here, you'll notice that we have another option. So we have everything else the same, but the other option, it says method MLMV in parenthesis, and that's referring to maximum likelihood with missing values. And that's essentially full information, maximum likelihood uh, estimation. So in a nutshell, that's kind of um, what the authors uh, ended up uh, choosing to do in terms of how to, to deal with missing data. Just keep in mind, missing data is one of those ever-present uh, problems when you're dealing with large data sets, and pr in particular, when you've got a large number of, of variables. So one option to deal with uh, missing data is list-wise deletion. And... Um, that's really the default in, in many, many, many programs. Uh, and like, for instance, if I run a regression in Stata or an analysis of variance, it's going to use list-wise deletion. If I want to use some other approach to dealing with missing data, then I have to kind of actively select that. So we've, we've used list-wise deletion uh, with, when we just ran the analysis using maximum likelihood by itself. And then if we select maximum likelihood with missing values, then we're invoking full information, maximum likelihood estimation. So the estimates that we have right here, these are all unstandardized uh, coefficients. I can kind of move things around a little bit to, to clean it up and be able to find things. There we go. So these are all unstandardized estimates at this point. Um, and the author actually in his book, he uses a standardized uh, solution in terms of reporting. So, you know, just kind of going back, you can see in the output, it says standardized and it's got the standardized uh, path coefficients and, and so forth, as well as significance uh, levels. And then in the actual path diagram, he's reporting on the standardized coefficients and significances and so forth. So um, at any rate, we'll go, kind of go back to our SEM builder right here. Uh, actually, I'll just kind of show you the output anyway. Uh, so the unstandardized estimates based on 416 of total effective cases, um, these are the estimates right here uh, for math and reading. You can see that 
both math and reading at age seven were positive predictors of math 20, at uh, 21, and both of these are statistically significant. This is the uh, autoregressive path right here, which is significant. And then for reading uh, 21, you've got math seven, um, you know, uh, being significant as well as reading seven being significant. So this is for the autoregressive path right here. Uh, the cross lag path uh, estimate is for is this one right here. Uh, just so you know, too, if I use the eStat GOF stats all option right here and press enter, you can see that it says, uh, you know, the chi-square goodness of fit test. You can see that it says um, it gives a chi-square value of zero. Um, and basically, there's no test. And that's because we've used up all the information uh, in terms of the sample covariance matrix when estimating our model. So the model is just identified. And when the model is just identified, it's basically going to say, hey, the model fits the data perfectly. So um, so these goodness of fit measures are not going to be uh, terribly useful um, when it comes to evaluating the fit of the model. We really have to kind of look at the, um, the equation level to evaluate uh, fit. So if we want to look at the, so kind of going back up here then, that's where we are actually kind of able to look at the, uh, at the equation level. So we have math 21 regressed onto math 7 and reading 7. That's the first equation. We saw that uh, reading seven was a significant predictor. Then we have read 21, which is regressed onto um, read seven and math seven. The cross lag path for math seven is significant. So that's providing some evidence right there of, um, of fit. When we look at the uh, equation level goodness of fit, if I type in ESTAT GOF, oh, excuse me, EQ GOF, and enter, you can see that we get the R square values over here. So in terms of the uh, proportion of variation accounted for in math 21 by math seven and read seven, it's uh, roughly 20.58%. Uh, when we look at um, the read 21 uh, endogenous variable right here, uh, the math seven and read seven account for about 28.5% of the variation. But we also have to kind of keep in mind that really the larger con contributor in both of these is going to end up being the earlier uh, lag version of that variable. So now let's go ahead and just um, look at the standardized coefficients, which is really what um, the author um, uh, uh, presents in the in the uh, in his book and in, in this particular part of the chapter. So we'll click on estimate. We'll go to reporting right here, and we'll click on standardized coefficients and values, and then click on OK. So now we have the standardized path coefficients in our model, and uh, you can see we've got. Uh, the standardized path coefficient for math 7 on math 21 is 0.31. The standardized coefficient of, of reads, uh, excuse me, of uh, the, the this other autoregressive path, read 7 on read 21 is 0.49. So it looks like, you know, because we've, uh, in the fully standardized uh, model, uh, basically what we're doing is we're treating all of the variables as having a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So we have essentially the same scaling for all of these variables. So we we could, uh, from that standpoint, we could kind of make comparisons. Uh, you know, just kind of looking at the uh, the autoregressive paths, we can see that the autoregressive path from read seven to read twenty one is larger than the autoregressive path from math seven to math twenty one. Um, we couldn't really kind of talk in the, exactly the same way if we were looking at the unstandardized estimates, but we can kind of look at this and just kind of make that uh, statement about which which path looks to be uh, larger. Then when it comes to the um, the uh, cross lag paths, we see that the path from read uh, math seven to read 21 appears to be larger than the path from read seven to math 21. If we look at our output right here, um, you can see, let me just make sure I got this straight. This is where sometimes you kind of have to move things around to make sure that you got, uh, that you're interpreting right. So, so there's math seven to read 21. The uh, path coefficient is uh, 0.11. 
path coefficient from reads having to uh, math 21 uh, is 0.26. But, you know, a lot of times it's just easier to go into the output and uh, uh, and then look at it there. So you can see uh, here's our autoregressive path from math 7 to math 21. Uh, that's obviously significant from read 7 to read 21, that path coefficient significant. And then for read 7, the cross lag path from read seven to math 21 is 0.2, roughly 0.26 significant. And then from uh, the cross lag path from math seven to read 21, it's 0.11. And it's going to be significant at the 0.05. But you can see uh, this, this effect right here appears to be weaker um, than the effect of reading seven on math 21. So uh, while there may be some bidirectionality, maybe the effect of, of um, earlier reading on later math appears to be a little bit stronger than uh, the earlier effect of math on reading. So the next thing that I want to show you, uh, the author in in uh, in the chapter um, uses some syntax to test the difference in uh, some of these coefficients right here. So uh, we might want to test whether there's a significant difference uh, in terms of the autoregressive paths and the um, or the uh, cross lag paths, so uh, what he's basically doing in this uh, in this part of the chapter here is he's using an estat post estimation command uh, to test uh, test uh, this out. So I'm going to go ahead and call up. Let me just kind of go back in here. I'm going to go. I'm going to create a do file. I'll I'll click on uh, new do file editor right here. I'm going to go back to the chapter and kind of open this up right here and just kind of follow along with the, the presentation. I'll kind of talk you through it uh, in terms of what's going on. So right now we're going to start off. You'll notice that uh, he starts off with SEM comma COEF legend. OK, so this is really a very useful um, uh, function right here. If I highlight this and run it, what I'm going to get is a breakdown of all of the uh, parameters within the model. So you'll notice that we've, uh, in terms of the legend right here, you'll see we've got our coefficient like for, for the effect of math seven on math 21. But then the legend right here, you'll see we've got this underscore B. You've got math 21, which is the variable being predicted, colon math seven. And you might recognize this sort of um, this sort of layout um, and you might uh, find this familiar to some earlier uh, discussions that I've had on the use of the uh, NL uh, com uh, command. Um, basically, that's nonlinear combination command. So in this particular case, we've got, you know, each of uh, sort of a breakdown of each of these coefficients. And we're going to use that in order to carry out uh, our tests. So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to uh, select We'll type in estat uh, stdize, -E. and the reason why is because we, he's actually testing uh, the standardized coefficients to see if the if there's a difference, a significant difference uh, in the standardized coefficients. So that's why this stdize -E is incorporated. Then he's typed in test, and then from there um, the uh, path uh, coefficients. Again, you can use the coefficient legend um, uh, command uh, in order to essentially be able to kind of figure out your labels and so forth. If you don't want to have to sit there and just think through everything and you just want to steal, uh, you know, steal some of those parameters out of that and, and, and paste it into your, um, your syntax, that's, that's not a bad thing. I've, I've done that plenty of times. So anyway, I'm, I am going to go ahead and type this in. We've, we've got underscore B math 21 colon math seven and then uh from there we've got uh what looks to be uh equals underscore b read 21 colon uh read seven okay so we're testing the equality of these two autoregressive paths so if i highlight this and run it let me see if i can find the little run in here there it is you can see that now we have a chi-square test, which is testing the equality of these two paths. So going, you know, as we think back to our, our uh, path diagram, 
Again, the autoregressive paths are math seven to math 21, read seven to read 21. So we're testing whether there's a difference in the standardized coefficients uh, for these two paths. And you can see right here that the autoregressive, um, uh, uh, there is a significant difference in the um, in in those two autoregressive paths. Uh, so there does to appear to be some difference in terms of the stability over time with these two paths. And uh, just as a refresher, uh, the path that was that had the stronger coefficient was from read seven to read twenty one. So in a nutshell. Uh, we have greater stability over time with the reading measure than we do with the math measure. Okay, so now what we'll do is we'll proceed to the next uh, part of this, which is uh, looks to be testing whether there's a difference um, between the standardized cross lag paths. So I'm going to type in estat stdize colon test underscore, and then we've got uh, b. Then inside this, we're going to say uh, math 21 colon read seven. Okay, so that's for the first cross lag path. Then we'll type in equals and then uh, underscore B. And then we'll type in read 21 colon math seven. So we're testing those two cross lagged um, effects to see uh, if there's a difference in their um, in those effects. So I'll go ahead and uh, run this through the do file. And you can see here that we've got the chi-square value and a p-value. So the p-value of 0 0.03 is certainly less than uh, a conventional 0 0.05. And this would suggest then that there is a significant difference in the standardized coefficients for those cross-lag paths. So going back and just taking a quick look, remember that the path from math 7 to read 21 is 0.26. And that's definitely larger than the path from read 7 to uh, math 21, which is 0.11. So that's basically um, just a very uh, simple uh, overview of cross-lag panel analysis uh, using Stata. And again, we're, we're just using an example from that book I was referring to, uh, Discovering Structural Equation Modeling Using Stata. So that's going to wrap up this discussion, and um, hopefully you found this useful.